dig into a sumptuous feast on, feast on God's Word. Father, we continually pray as we gather for study that you would open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your law. Your law is our meditation all the day. Help us to refocus in the middle of the week on Christ, who is truly God and truly man. Thank you for faithful saints in church history that have defended uh, the orthodox view of who Christ is. And as John reminds us in his epistle, we can't be wrong about Christ. And so, Lord, uh, capture our thoughts, be with us as uh, uh, in, in the heat that we would just be able to focus on you and your glory. We pray in the matchless name of Christ. Amen. All right, sorry for the lateness, but at least we were able to print off some handouts for you. Take your Bibles and run with me over to Second John. Second John. We are on, what I, if I've numbered things right, Lesson 8 on church history. Now we're into the late patristic and early Middle Ages, looking at doctrinal debates and councils and controversies. Second John, you can pick whatever chapter you want. I'm going to go to verse 7, and uh, uh, you'll realize there's only one chapter there anyways. But uh, Second John, verse 7 through 11. The Apostle John says, Many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what you have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Notice clear and unambiguous statement that he just said. If you're wrong about Christ, you don't have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you, Again, remember itinerant teachers that the church was obligated to house and to support and take care of. If any of them come to you and do not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. You know, John's statement wouldn't go well in a culture like ours that is more interested in being uh, uh, politically correct uh, you are obligated for hospitality, and John says, uh, you may not have done the teaching, but you support a false teacher and you share in their wickedness, and uh, that's pretty serious language. Well, we want to praise God for faithful warriors who fought for biblical fidelity, especially when the orthodox position of Christ's deity or humanity was attacked. You can't be wrong on either one, his deity or his humanity. Chalcedon articulated, and I quote, following the Holy Fathers, we un unanimously teach and confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in divinity and perfect in humanity, the same truly God and truly man composed of rational soul and body, consubstantial with the Father as to His divinity and consubstantial with us as to His humanity, like us in all things but sin. He was begotten from the Father before all ages as to His divinity and in these last days for us and for our salvation was born as to His humanity of the Virgin Mary, the bearer of our salvation, who was born... Uh, I misread, I skipped up a line. The bearer of God, he is to be acknowledged in two natures without confusion, change, division, or separation. The distinction between natures was never abolished by their union, but rather the character proper to each of the two natures preserved as they came together in one person and one hypostasis or one substance. So two natures, one person. So our study tonight is about some of these early debates regarding Christ and the councils of the church that were convened and how to have a controversy to the glory of God. Now, we read together from 2 John... You could add to that many other New Testament predictions and warnings. 
of coming false teachers who seek to undermine the truth and distort sound doctrine from within the church. Our Savior Himself said in Matthew 7, 15, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Acts 20, Apostle Paul similarly instructed the Ephesian elders, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert. So Paul said to the elders in the church, They're coming. Jesus, before Paul, had already said that there were false teachers present. And so when, the, when Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, and the apostles passed away, they would keep on proliferating. They'd keep on coming. So they've already been here, and they will just multiply. Peter told his readers, false prophets arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the Master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves." And we read here in 2 John 7, many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. So deception and the spirit of antichrist is already in the world. It will always be with us. That's why Jude warned certain persons who have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. There's probably people that have been thrown out of the church in church history that, um, and, the, and the church tolerates those ones that would have been thrown out. As errors arose in the early church, the early centuries, the true church responded by defending what Scripture teaches and clearly articulating the truth in the face of heretical attack. I'd mentioned during one of our studies uh, in Titus 1, the elders are told that uh, your job, here's your job description, teach sound doctrine and refute that which contradicts. And so there is a building voice and a blasting voice coming from faithful shepherds. After Emperor Constantine brought peace to Christians living in the Roman Empire in the early 4th century, church leaders were able to address the major heresies of their day by organizing synods and councils. The largest of these councils were organized by the emperors themselves and involved church leaders from all over the Roman world. These councils are called ecumenical councils, because they include all of the churches in the empire. Well, in church history, there are seven ecumenical councils that are generally recognized. So don't be scared of any of your ignorance of church history and just uh, realize there's, there's on average about seven. The central theological issues addressed at these seven councils centered on the person of Christ. That's why... He's of particular interest to the Apostle John. You can't be wrong about Jesus and call yourself one of his followers. So in this lesson, we want to focus on the three most important of the seven councils, the Council of Nicaea in 325, the First Council of Constantinople in 381, and the Council of Chalcedon in 451. I'll probably mention those dates again so that when I give you a pop quiz next week, you can uh, uh, spit out those dates for me. We're only going to capitalize on those three, and then at the end, uh, maybe one slide will we'll summarize the other four. So in Second John that we read, verses 7 to 11, the orthodox statement coming from Scripture is that Jesus is truly God and truly man. Those phrases are crucial to orthodoxy. You cannot do as your pastor used to say as a young Christian and say that Jesus was 100% God and 100% man because you can't have 200% of anything, okay? He's just truly God and, and truly man. In that passage of Second John, 
the primary doctrinal issue that the false teachers were distorting was Jesus being God in the flesh. This first of the three councils we wanted to focus on, we had mentioned back two or three lessons ago, the Council of Nicaea in 325. The key issue is the deity of Christ. We had first mentioned this when we were studying Athanasius. The context uh, you could set up by going back to that former lesson. Uh, we had mentioned in that lesson on Athanasius that there were nearly 320 bishops gathered in Nicaea at the invitation of Emperor Constantine. The council lasted more than 40 days. In addition to addressing the doctrinal issue of Christ's deity, the council also addressed the date for celebrating what we refer to as Resurrection Sunday, and some of the pagans call it Easter, right? But uh, here are the, the positions that came at the council. One of those positions that I list there for you is heterousios, that Jesus was of a different substance than the Father. This was Arius' view. And so, uh, we said it's more tradition than something that we can prove, but the first Santa Claus, what? Slapped him in the face for his heresy. Uh, but he taught that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was a created being. He's a, of a different substance than the Father. Thus, he argued, Jesus was of a different substance or essence than God the Father. On that basis, Arius contended that Christ was not equal in authority or deity with the Father. To put it simply, Arius denied Jesus as God, teaching instead that He is a creature. And there are plenty of cults and isms and schisms of our day that come to the same conclusion. Uh, one or two of you would drop some stuff in my truck tonight, and if you did, you, you would see in the black console right there are all the tracks for people that are usually in my town square almost every day who are trying to teach that Jesus was a God, little g God. Well, the second position was homoousios. Jesus is of the same substance. In contrast to Arius, Alexander and Athanasius insisted Christ was not a created being. He is the eternal Son of God who is co-equal to the Father. Because God the Son is eternal, just like the Father, He's of the same substance or the same essence as the Father. In other words, Alexander and Athanasius affirmed that Jesus is God, teaching He's not a creature, but the uncreated Creator, capital C. The third position at the Council of Nicaea was homoousios, and if you notice, there's just a diphthong. One letter goes from orthodoxy to heresy. This states that Jesus was of a similar substance. When Arius' original position, heterousios, was rejected, he gave a modified version. It suggested that the Son of God was of a similar substance to the Father. Arius and his supporters shifted to that position using the language of similar substance to minimize the differences they said existed between the Father and the Son. Alexander and Athanasius refused to accept this position because they rightly understood that similar still means what? means different. Okay. Uh, so when you're called pig-headed or too narrow-minded, remember Athanasius. The result is that the views of Arius are rejected by the council. The Nicene Creed, which was adopted by the council, defended the truth that God the Son is co-eternal, co-essential, and co-equal with God the Father. And here's the main part of the Nicene Creed. It states, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of His Father, of the substance of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, 
being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, both which are in heaven and in earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate and was made man. He suffered, and the third day he rose again and ascended into heaven, and he shall come again to judge both the living and the dead, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. Now, the Nicene Creed continues by noting that the Catholic Church affirms this doctrine, and let's just remind ourselves that uh, at that time in history, the term Catholic simply meant universal, not referring to the Roman Catholic Church like it does today. The Creed focuses on the deity of Christ because that was the primary issue at stake. Although it affirms belief in the Holy Spirit, it does not explain the doctrine of the Holy Spirit in any detail. So let's move several, century, uh, several decades later to the second major church council, and that is the first council of Constantinople, 381. Key issues are the deity and humanity of Christ and also the deity of the Spirit. Him, not it. Remember, uh, your pastor warned you I might become like that first Santa Claus and slap you if you refer to the Holy Spirit as an it. He's the third member of the Trinity. The context of the Council of Constantinople is thus. In spite of the Nicene Creed, the false teachings of Arius continued to be very popular in the Roman Empire. And it's interesting that uh, people keep hanging on to heresies no matter how much they've been thrown out. The view of homoousios, that of the Son of God is of a similar but still different substance than the Father, was particularly popular. They just couldn't get rid of it. Athanasius, along with other church leaders like Basil of Caesarea and Gregory of Nyssa and Gregory of Nazianzus, continued to defend the doctrine of Christ's equality to the Father. In rejecting the doctrine of the Trinity, the followers of Arius also denied the deity of the Holy Spirit. Uh, proponents of this view were known as, I'm going to try not to... Uh, trip over my tongue here, but uh, pneumatomachians, pneumatomachians, say that three times fast. It means combatters against the Spirit, because that's what they were doing. Basil of Caesarea refuted their views in his work on the Holy Spirit. A new heresy about Christ called Apollinarianism also arose. So there's the attack on the Spirit and continued assaults on Christ. The creator of this view, Apollinarius of Laodicea, taught that although Jesus possessed a human body, he didn't have a human spirit or soul. Instead, his physical, physical body was like a shell occupied by a divine mind. So in other words, Jesus' deity trumped his humanity. Again, you cannot deny his deity, you cannot deny his humanity for an orthodox biblical view on Christ. Well, that is, uh, the issues about Christ and the Spirit motivated Emperor Theodosius to convene a council in Constantinople in 381. The council lasted for three months. So, first council was over 40 days, now we've got three months. Three positions. The first is represented by Arianism. Advocates of the Arian position held to the homoousius view of Jesus' nature. They contend that although the Son of God possessed a similar nature to God the Father, he did not possess the same nature. They came to this conclusion because they denied the eternality of the Son arguing instead that he was a created being. Now, there's few well-known evangelicals, one that uh, you, uh, most of you really appreciate who has been in the same pulpit for 55 years, and earlier on in his ministry denied the eternal sonship, but he nuanced it in such a way that it was not heretical. 
because to deny Jesus' eternality typically led to heresy like it did in Arianism. And I'll save that conversation for another time because that's not the point of the lesson tonight. Second position was Apollinarianism. Although Apollinarius affirmed Christ's deity, he did not accept the full humanity of Christ. Instead, he saw Jesus' human body as the physical shell in which his divine mind dwelt. His deity was like a letter being placed inside the envelope of his humanity. Thus, the, thus Apollinarius denied Jesus possessed a human soul. Third position, a.k.a. right, biblical position, and that is tr- Trinitarianism. The orthodox position insisted that the incarnate Christ is both truly God and truly man. Hence, he possessed both a full divine nature and a full human nature. Moreover, with regard to the Holy Spirit, the orthodox position affirmed the full deity of the Spirit of God. The Trinity consists of three co-equal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What were the results? The council affirmed the Nicene Creed. Both Arianism and Apollinarianism were denounced as heretical positions. In so doing, the council affirmed a belief in both the full deity and full humanity of Christ. In an effort to defend the deity of the Spirit, the council expanded on the Nicene Creed. Nicene Creed was what, 325? Now in 381... You've got the uh, council that is explicit in its affirmation of the Holy Spirit as the third member of the Trinity. Let me give you the expanded section regarding the Spirit that the council added to the Nicene Creed. Because wherever doctrine is attacked, that's where the church needs to speak out. They said, we believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who is to be worshipped and glorified with the Father and the Son, and who spoke through the prophets. Now that phrase, and the Son, him, the Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son, is include, uh, included in brackets in your mind because it's not part of the original Greek version of the creed. Instead, was added by the Western church to the Latin version of the creed. It eventually led to controversy between the eastern and western halves of the Roman church. Now, if you wanted to jot down on this slide a cross-reference to Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, that answers, you know, Apollinarianism denied the full or true humanity of Christ, and the question comes up, why is it so important that our mediator be truly human? because he's our sympathetic high priest who was tempted in all ways like as we are, yet what? Without sin. So we needed the perfect man representing us, the God-man, Christ Jesus. Third council, Council of Chalcedon, 451. So we've moved to another century now. Key issue at Chalcedon is the two natures of Christ, His deity and His humanity. At Constantinople, they had uh, affirmed the true deity and true humanity of Christ, the eternal Son of God, the second member of the Trinity, who took on flesh and became a man in His incarnation. This is Philippians 2, 6 and 7. But there's a question that remained as to how do those two natures, His, His deity and His humanity, relate to one another in the person of Christ? That's the question that was addressed at the Council of Chalcedon. Emperor Marcion called the council. He had denounced the earlier council that met in Ephesus in 449 as being illegitimate. The Council of Chalcedon was convened to override it. We got 370 bishops that attended, and one of them that did not attend, Leo I, sent a letter called his tome to be read at the council. The content of Leo's tome was approved by the council as articulating the orthodox position, which I'll give you in just a moment. 
So at this third church council, you've got three main positions. First wrong one is Nestorianism. This view divided the two natures of Christ, putting a wall of separation between them to the point that Jesus was viewed as two persons. There's a debate as to whether Nestorius, the Archbishop of Constantinople, actually held the view that's attached to his name. But in summary, Nestorianism asserted that Christ possessed two natures and was therefore two persons. Eh, got it wrong. Second wrong position, Eutychianism. So in response to Nestorianism, Eutyches emphasized that Jesus Christ was a single person with a single divine nature. The human nature is either eclipsed by the divine nature or mixed together with the divine, resulting in kind of a hybrid nature. In summary, Eutychianism argued that Christ was only one person and therefore possessed only one nature. Again, this question at Chalcedon is, okay, we affirm the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ, but how do those two natures coincide into one person? What's the third position, a.k.a. the orthodox position or the biblical position or what Leo, the non-attendee, sent as the position? Well, Leo affirmed the hypostatic union, that Christ in His incarnation possessed two natures, divine and human. If Jesus is both truly God and truly man, the integrity of each nature has to be preserved. Yet at the same time, Leo also affirmed that Christ is a single person. In becoming a man, Jesus didn't become multiple personalities. Jesus was not a spiritual schizophrenic of deity merging with humanity. In summary, Leo's position asserted Christ is a single person possessing two natures. So what was the result of Chalcedon, this third ecumenical council? Well, Leo's position was affirmed as the, by the council as being biblical and the historic position of the church. Writings of Eutyches and his followers are condemned. The council produced a creed to articulate the orthodox position. The, this is the Chalcedonian creed, and I, I think this is what I put on our Facebook page as the advertisement for the lesson tonight. I don't remember because many hours ago. Here's what it states. Following the Holy Fathers, we unanimously teach and confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in divinity and perfect in humanity, the same truly God and truly man, composed of rational soul and body, consubstantial with the Father as to His divinity and consubstantial with us as to His humanity, like us in all things but sin." He was begotten from the Father before all ages as to His divinity, and in these last days for us and for our salvation was born as to His humanity of the Virgin Mary, the bearer of God. We confess that one and the same Christ, Lord, and the only begotten Son is to be acknowledged in two natures without confusing change, division, or separation. The distinction between natures was never abolished by their union, but rather the character proper to each of the two natures was preserved as they came together in one person and one hypostasis or one substance. Let me explain a couple of those phrases that uh, you heard. The reference to Mary as the bearer of God was a title affirmed by the Council of Ephesus in 431. The line that says that Jesus possessed two natures without confusion, change, division, or separation is a response to those two wrong positions at the council, Eutychianism and Nestorianism. In contrast to Eutychianism, the creed explains that Christ possessed two natures without confusion or change. In other words, his deity did not trump his humanity, and one was not the other. 
Against Nestorianism, Chalcedon further teaches that Christ possesses true deity, true humanity, without division or separation. So these four fences of orthodoxy, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation, are kind of guardrails for articulating the mystery of Christ's incarnation without falling into heretical error, falling on one side or the other. You know, you, you, you read Philippians 2, and it's mind-boggling what actually occurred in the fullness of time when God strapped on humanity, fully God and fully man. Well, I'd mentioned that in church, throughout church history, there are, it's generally agreed there were seven main ecumenical councils. I've walked you through three of them. Let's just summarize the other four. One is the Council of Ephesus, 431. At this council, the church sought to protect the doctrine of Christ's deity even in His incarnation. Accordingly, they affirmed that a proper title for Mary is the term Theotokos, meaning bearer of God. And the purpose behind the title wasn't to elevate Mary, but to safeguard the deity of Christ. He did not sacrifice His deity to become a man. In the incarnation, God the Son took on flesh and became human. When Mary gave birth to Jesus, the baby in the manger was God incarnate. We can't miss it. It was important for the council at Ephesus to affirm that. Second, ecumenic, uh, second other ecumenical council would be the Second Council of Constantinople. You know, if the first one was 451, this is 553. In the East, even after the Council of Chalcedon, there remained a significant number of people who rejected the hypostatic union, insisting instead that, that Jesus possessed a single nature. Advocates of this view were called monophysites. Mono meaning one and physis meaning nature. Emperor Justinian convened a council to address the controversy over the issue. And that council affirmed the Council of Chalcedon, but it also condemned the writings of three earlier theologians who had been associated with Nestorius. By condemning these earlier theologians, Justinian hoped to improve relations with these monophysites. Then you've got the Third Council of Constantinople, 680. The primary question answered at this council was whether Christ possessed one will or two wills. In keeping with the church's teaching that Christ possessed two natures, the council affirmed that he likewise possessed two wills, divine and human. The council was careful to clarify that Christ's human will is always in perfect submission to in accordance with his divine will. Fourth and finally, Second Council of Nicaea, 787. You got that? Got your date down for your quiz next week? Seventh and eighth centuries, major debate erupted in the East over the veneration of icons or images of Jesus and the saints. Some of the emperors were concerned that icons of Jesus in particular violate the second commandment, Exodus 20, verse 4, and thus constituted idolatry. So in 754, a council met in Hyeria to condemn icons, but its rulings were overturned in 787 by the Second Council of Nicaea, which affirmed icons as being orthodox. Those who supported the use of icons argued that icons of Jesus do not violate the second commandment because Christ is the image of the invisible God. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus as he lived literally in the flesh before people. You know, as I mentioned that he is the invisible, or the image of the invisible God, that's Colossians 1.15. Hebrews 1.3 says he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. Conclusion. Let's evaluate councils and creeds. Seven listed are considered ecumenical because they included representatives from both the eastern and western halves of the Roman church. 
As a result, they're accepted in both Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. So you, whether you go to the Orthodox Church in Rogue River or go across the river to the Roman Catholic Church, they affir both affirm. Protestant groups have generally held varied opinions about which councils to accept, and we've got some of those on our website. A lot of evangelicals, for example, wouldn't accept the Second Council of Nicaea in 787. That council, with its approval of the veneration of icons, is particularly troubling for evangelicals who rightly view such practices as competing with the purity of worship that God requires. You know, when I um, had a job in Southern California, one of my five jobs when I was going to seminary, and I'd be in apartments, and uh, I'd get the gag reflex every time I see a portrait of Jesus with this heart shining and everything else, and it's like, yay, yay, yay. Um, but that's neither here nor there. In learning about the church councils and historic creeds, Let's highlight and remember something that we've highlighted a couple of other times in our study. That God's Word is our authority over church history and church tradition. That means that the decision of a church council is valid only insofar as it accords with what the Word of God teaches. Like the noble Bereans in Acts 17.11 we need to go to the Scriptures to evaluate all the teachings and traditions of men and see if they pass muster. Paul likewise tells the Thessalonians to examine everything carefully, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22. Are we grateful for historic councils? Absolutely. To the extent that they affirm clear biblical truths like the deity of Christ, we're, we're grateful. But we need to remember that the authority for what we believe is not found in the councils of church history, but in the truth of God's Word. We exegete Scripture, not creeds, though they have their value. Turn with me to one last passage, if you would. It would be the Gospel of Mark in chapter number 7. Mark 7, 6 to 13. And here's the question I want you to think about. About what this passage teaches about the priority of Scripture over religious tradition. Matthew, six, uh, Matthew 7, verse 6. Jesus said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In other words, they can profess good orthodoxy from the lips, with their heart being far from him. Jesus said, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandments of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. Now, I think I'd already mentioned we've got links on our website to the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed, Athanasius Creed. We've got added statements because the Bible's been under attack in modern church history, and so there's the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy, there's the Danvers statement on biblical manhood and womanhood because people are confused about what a man is and what a woman is. There is the Nashville statement on biblical sexuality. There's now a statement on social justice and the gospel, one of the worst attacks on the gospel of our day. 
And I was scrounging around today and realized that we need to add uh, an affirmations and denial statement on the sufficiency and authority of Scripture that I'd uh, gotten from ACBC because of all the things, the wrong teachings assaulting the church of Jesus Christ in our day, it is the sufficiency of Scripture. This is our authority. Let's look to him in prayer, shall we? Father, thank you for saints that have gone by who have been faithful to articulate, even in written form, how to think clearly and precisely and biblically about the most important issues of life, about who Christ is according to the Gospels of Scripture, who the Spirit of God is. God, help us as we are barraged regularly with just slight nuances of difference. Help us to guard the treasure entrusted to our care, the once for all faith delivered. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for your indwelling spirit. We pray in the matchless name of Christ. Amen.